voyage of ancient times will come from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm a biblical scholar and a specialist in early Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. For probably the past decade now, all of my scholarly work has been really focused on the study and investigation of fragments that were sold to private collections in the 1990s and then the aughts between like 2000 and 2014 my own suspicions and and the the work of a number of other scholars who uh, became convinced over this time that uh, these fragments were forgeries. This became a pretty big news story. It was uh, widely publicized and reported on in various news outlets between 2016 and 2018. I was then commissioned by uh, one of the owners of uh, these fragments, the Museum of the Bible, to conduct an independent uh, investigation of their scribal features in an effort to provide more information uh, and a determination as to their uh, likely authenticity or forgery. So that's me. If you are a regular viewer of this channel, you're probably expecting here the next installment of my uh, new series about the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls Unapologetically. The next video is, is certainly in the works, but I really thought it important to make this video to provide some information and an update and a response uh, to something that happened uh, at the beginning of this past week. So on Tuesday, the 31st of January, Sean McDowell, famous apologist who runs a very popular YouTube channel here, hosted a pre-recorded interview that he had with Dr. Craig A. Evans. He is a professor at Houston Baptist University, and he's a former teacher of mine, actually. When I was doing my master's degree, he was the second reader on my MA thesis, uh, while we were both still at Trinity Western, way back in the, uh, in the late 90s. So, in this interview, Dr. Evans was providing an update about all these fake fragments that um, were widely publicized in between 2017 and 2020 as part of this large project that uh, I had been working on for that full decade. So as you can imagine, I was keenly interested to hear what happened in this interview. And this brings us to what's taking place here. Today, what I saw was surprising, uh, to say the least. It was really quite shocking. Basically, Dr. Evans took the opportunity in uh, this interview to provide what he believed to be new information, which actually exonerated all the fragments in all the private collections to be genuine. In what follows, we're going to talk first about the choice to make such a, an explosive announcement on a YouTube platform like Apologist Sean McDowell's. I'll talk a little bit about his representation of the history of the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls forgeries. I will talk about some of the science that he brings to bear. He's got some new ideas on the basis of his belief that these are now authentic with regards to what they mean on a larger scale for uh, the scholarly study of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then towards the end of the interview, he spent some time talking about the legal implications. So let's just get into this and let's take a look at uh, some of the selections from this Great. interview. Honored to have you on. When you and I first started talking about this at uh, a number of weeks ago at a conference, you started sharing stuff and I thought, how have I missed this? you got to come on my show and share this with my viewers. And in this show, you actually are going to break some news that I think is going to stir things up. So can't wait to get there. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, it's rather impressive. And what it's done, um, it's opened up a whole new, a whole new uh, item of inquiry. 
And so, Sean, your program will be the first to hear this. So okay. I'll not only get you and your hearers updated mm. on, on the, these fragments aren't fake after all, but are genuine, but it raises a whole new uh, question about uh, Jewish understanding of purity and why the leather scrolls were used in the first place, leather instead of presumably cheaper papyrus. So we're into something that uh, it's going to be quite astonishing. It's going to generate a lot of conversation. And to the best of my knowledge, um, you were the first to hear this and the first to air it. First of all, I think we need to talk a little bit about uh, the venue here. Both Sean and, uh, and Dr. Evans make a big deal here about this being big breaking news that he is announcing for the first time on Sean's channel. I, I have to ask, I mean, what are we doing here? With, with this sort of explosive information, with the magnitude of what uh, Evans is about to announce, why are we doing this on a YouTube channel belonging to a Christian apologist? The proper place for this kind of break is in a scholarly publication or minimally through an established media outlet. Although, you know, there's lots of problems with that in and of itself. So this was confusing to me why uh, Dr. Evans would choose to make these massive announcements on Sean's YouTube channel. So this interview was aired on Tuesday, the uh, 31st of January. It was pre-recorded. Dr. Evans actually contacted me on the Monday, the 30th of January, to give me a heads up that this was coming out. So I knew in advance and uh, he, he provided a little bit of information in his note to me about the contents of this interview. So right away, I was very keen to see exactly what he had to say. Let me back up. These fragments, here's what created all the suspicion. A wealthy collector in Norway gave an interview 20 years ago and he said, oh man, I'd give a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars to have fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he actually named certain books, uh, curiously, mostly from the Pentateuch and plus the uh, old Aramaic text. We'd found, I think, at least 20 fragmentary scrolls of Enoch in Aramaic. And so he mentioned numbers mm. and Deuteronomy and Enoch. And curiously, within a couple of years, on the market were fragments of the very books he mentioned. And of course, what a lot of people assumed was, you know, uh, poor recent doctoral students in Hebrew who hadn't found a job yet and had $100,000 of tuition, debt loan to pay off, got busy with some authentic fragments of very old leather and wrote out brand new script, just a few words and lines, you know, on, on fragments that in some cases were hardly bigger than a postage stamp and started selling them to this collector in Norway and, and into the very schools you mentioned, and, and as well as the Museum of the Bible, the Green family and everyone else. And so people were immediately suspicious. Isn't that strange? This guy gives an interview, mentions certain scrolls that he'd love to buy, pay a lot of money to get them. And lo and behold, a couple years later, a bunch of these fragments start showing up on the market. Now I have to admit, mm. I was suspicious too. So Evans begins right away with this story, this this background story about the uh, sale of Dead Sea Scrolls fragments in the uh, the 90s and the 2000s, then the suspicions that, that started to be raised with regards to their authenticity at this time. And uh, right away, there's some significant problems with this story. Most people agree that this story generally begins with the Norwegian collector, Martin Skoyen, who was one of the first, I don't believe he was the first, but he was certainly one of the first private collectors to actually successfully purchase Dead Sea Scrolls fragments. And he managed to purchase a couple, at least, of authentic Dead Sea Scrolls fragments. He owns a very small piece of 1QSB that he purchased from one of the scholars who originally worked on this manuscript all the way back in the 1950s. He also owns a piece of uh, the Genesis Apocryphon that he similarly acquired. So he already had a couple of Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, but then Evans 
uh, makes mention of this famous interview that he gave to Herschel Shanks, who was the editor-in-chief of the Biblical Archaeology Review back in 2002. Evans says that it was in that interview that Scoyan claimed to be on the lookout for more Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, that he had money to spend to buy more Dead Sea Scrolls fragments. And then he says that Scoyan provided a shopping list, basically, of things that he was looking for from the Pentateuch and Enoch and whatnot. This is only partially accurate. Yes, Scoyan gave this famous interview in 2002. And yes, he promoted strongly this idea that he had already purchased scrolls fragments and that he was on the lookout for more. What he never said in this interview was that he was looking for specific manuscripts. This is actually information that came out much, much later and was not publicized until I believe at least 2014 or 2015. This was part of a private disclosure by Martin Skoyan to Professor Torleif Elgvin and this happened back in 2009, while we were working on analyzing and publishing uh, Scoyne's collection of fragments. So right away, Evans has already messed up this story. He's, he's providing information that was not public at the time he claims it was, and it confuses the whole situation. So as for Evans's claim that he was skeptical about the authenticity of these fragments from the start, who knows? But I'm honestly fairly dubious about this because all the way through from the early 2000s up to the time I arrived in Norway in 2012 or 2013, there was not a lot of uh, suspicion being circulated about the authenticity of Scoyne's fragments. By and large, scholars had already accepted these as authentic and had been waiting now for years for uh, them to be published, which was, you know, one of the reasons I was in Norway in the first place, was to help with the publication of Scoyne's Fragments. So a former student of mine who will go nameless, <laughs> I did, did, did his MA with me when I was in British Columbia, Canada, and then he went on to do a PhD. He's a very fine student. Well, he had a research grant that took him to Norway and he was privileged to see this collection. And he did something that apparently no one had done before. He started looking at these fragments very carefully under a microscope. And he got some other experts involved. And they said, boy, this really looks suspicious. And so without going into a lot of the scientific detail, what he noticed was the leather look under the microscope was obviously old, it's 2000 years old. But this is what was mysterious. Uh, leather, you know, as you probably know, if it gets really old, it dries out and it cracks. And if under a microscope, it, just imagine my fingers, you know, the gaps between my fingers are the cracks. Well, he noticed that the ink would jump the cracks, the mm. ink, you know, that up the letters. So the leather was clearly old when the, the letters were added. And then he also noticed that there'd be uh, under the microscope, you could see it, uh, imperfections, uh, scrapes, uh, abrasions maybe bits of dirt, soil embedded into the letter, and the ink would go right over it. Hmm. So it's like, wait a minute. And so the suspicion was, and this is the conclusion everybody jumped to, was the leather is authentic. It's 2,000 years old. But these, these uh, fragments were blank. And only in recent years, say 20 years ago, after this interview was given, people started writing, and it's the Hebrew Bible, so it's no mystery as to what the text is. It'd be real easy to do it. So you'd take a little fragment, you place it right on the Hebrew Bible in a certain location, uh, and now you know which letters and words to write over the fragment. Looks like an authentic piece of Deuteronomy or numbers or whatever. So that was the theory. And so the, this was actually published up, uh, published in, in you know, Dead Sea, Dead sea Discoveries. That's a respectable journal, Revue de Qumran. And so, oh my gosh, and I mean, people got fired. There have been lawsuits initiated. Wow. We want money back. I mean, it's getting to be quite a deal. And again, for legal reasons, I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to get into it. Really. Sure. I have cautioned a few people, you know, you might be suing somebody for sending, selling you an authentic fragment. So be careful. <laughs> oh my goodness. Careful. You could end up getting countersued. I mean, this thing's, check it out. So what actually happened? We've already seen Evans make a couple of historical mistakes. He's also prone to making 
technical mistakes in his telling of the story as well. And this isn't surprising since, importantly, Dr. Evans is not a specialist in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in Jewish manuscripts, in Jewish paleography or epigraphy. He talks about, firstly, my apparent innovation for choosing to look at manuscript fragments under a microscope. This is nonsense at the outset. People need to know that scholars have been looking at Dead Sea Scrolls fragments under microscopes for years. There are people working at the Israel Antiquities Authority full time who look at Dead Sea Scrolls fragments under microscopes every single day. As far as I know, Torleif Elgvin was the first, one of the first certainly, to start looking at Dead Sea Scrolls fragments in Israel, the authentic ones at the IAA, the Israel Antiquities Authority, using a small digital multi-spectral microscope called a Dynalite. And then shortly thereafter, he started using the Dynalite on the fragments that he was working on in the Scullion collection. And this had all taken place uh, before I ever even arrived in Norway. So this was not my innovation. So what about this claim that our suspicions were raised because of the cracks in the leather on these uh, fragments, at first in uh, Martin Scullion's collection? Well, this isn't accurate either. Our first suspicions about the fragments belonging to Scullion had to do with scribal anomalies. These were misshaped letters, lines of text that appeared out of alignment with what would be an ordinarily inscribed manuscript and seemed very suspiciously to follow contours of existing damage already on the fragments. These included letters that were obviously written in such a way as to avoid damage already on the existing fragment. And then our suspicions increased with regards to certain readings that we were seeing on the fragments, features uh, of the letters themselves. It was a long process of this building up. I think it was our uh, paleographer, uh, Michael Langlois, who was probably the first to raise this question. Are these fragments authentic? Might they be forgeries? And this on the basis of his analysis of the scripts. It had nothing to do at this point with the condition of the leather. In fact, at one point, Langlois raised major concerns because he had detected on the edge of one of the fragments, like just a small little trace of ink that appeared to come from a highlighter. Like, how on earth is that on this supposedly ancient fragment? This was eventually dismissed on the belief that this is something that had, had accidentally occurred in the process of mounting uh, the fragment in its presentation box. But the point is that this is where it started for us and the concerns and our suspicions began to build from there. The problems that we had with the condition of these fragments and the, the quality of the letter had mostly to do, and a lot of this research has expanded over years from this, this starting point, but a lot of this had to do with uh, how the ink from a pen writing on what was obviously an already badly deteriorated, very rough surface would go over top of these abrasions and these uh, delaminated portions of the leather, but not only would they would they just pass over them, but some of these depressions of the leather were so deep that the ink would actually start to pool inside them. So to make a long story short, from there, a lot of our research ended up compiled and then published in two articles in Dead Sea Discoveries in 2017. One was collaborative. It was written by myself and seven other members of our team exclusively about Martin Scullion's fragments, and this was a, a combination of a scribal analysis with scientific forensic testing that had been undertaken in uh, Berlin. The second article was one that I wrote and published on my own, in which I took the opportunity 
And with the permission of both the Scullion Collection as well as the Museum of the Bible, I took the opportunity to explore comparatively the fragments in these two collections to which I had access. Uh, and I was looking for elements which could raise our confidence or our suspicions with regards to whether these might be forged or authentic. And I developed eight criteria through which I examined, I think it was 16 or 17 individual fragments. The alarming result in this study was that several of the fragments, at least half of them, if I remember correctly, didn't just exhibit one or two of what I identified as suspicious or dubious features, but multiple, most, even all of the eight. So it was really an accumulation of a mountain of evidence, not just the condition of the leather, which eventually convinced myself, all the members of my team, and then virtually, you know, the rest of the biblical studies community and the scientific world as to the uh, authenticity claims, the probability claims that these fragments are authentic. Uh, here's what happened, Sean. I've been appointed to the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation board. I'm a board member of wow. the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation. And the chairman of the board is Weston Fields. He's been, he's been operating this thing for 30 years. Its basic function is to raise money for Dead Sea Scrolls Scholarship. Okay. To get the, the DJD volumes, Discoveries of Judea and Desert, get them published, get them out there, get all the scrolls published. Well, he knows the Kando family. That's how we refer to it. That's not really the last name, but Kando was his nickname. The guy who was buying fragments from the ship, you know, the Bedouin and, mm -hmm. and Mark Samuel back in the day, Palestinian Christian man, way back. I met him in 1992. Mm -hmm. He died the following year in 93. So he's the guy. He knew like Bill Brownlee, my doctoral supervisor, Bill Brownlee, John Trevor, they were there in, in Israel, 47, 48, when the discoveries from the first cave came to light. So anyway, I'm discussing this. This was the number one business item at our meeting at the Society of Biblical Literature meeting just last November in uh, uh, Denver. And I said, can we, let's get updated on these fragments. And he said, oh, he says, they're all right. These are authentic. They came from Kondo's box of fragments that he keeps in Switzerland. There's no question they're authentic. And I said, yeah, but Weston, what about this evidence of the ink jumping the cracks, right? Mm -hmm. Going over pieces of dirt stuck on the leather and so on. And he told me, he said, all of the scrolls are that way. Really? <laughs> I just, what? He says, yeah, my student. <laughs> and the sure. guy's working with he said they should have looked at the authentic, the unquestionably authentic scrolls, the ones that were originally found that everybody knew about, not the ones that mysteriously showed up decades later in somebody's saddlebags from his camel. As I am editing this video response, I thought it important to pause and point out just how gross this surviving bit of colonial orientalism is in Evans's story. What he fails to mention is that the vast majority, probably over 90% of the total Dead Sea Scrolls came to the Palestinian Archaeological Museum this way via Kando in someone's saddlebags from his camel. They all have that. And so he says, there's no doubt in my mind, this is Weston Fields, he doesn't mind me quoting him. His, he's writing a history of the, the whole discovery of the scrolls and their publication, volume one's out, volumes two and three are, are in the press. And he says, all of the scrolls are that way. So I think when people hear Evans say that he's been added to the board of the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation, that they imagine this is some sort of governing body that oversees you know, the collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls. No, that's that's not the case at all. So the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation is a, a private group, a society, comprised of a number of, of academics and others. As Evans notes, their their mission originally, the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation was founded and has always been chaired by Weston Fields and with the express mandate to raise funds for the publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls 
which appeared in the series known as the Discoveries of the Judean Desert. There's 40 volumes. They were published between 1953 and 2010. So since the completion of the series, Weston Fields had started exploring new avenues through which to uh, generate funding. And he made a pitch to E.J. Brill, the famous academic publisher, for a new series called Dead Sea Scrolls Editions. And part of his pitch, importantly, was the inclusion of all these mostly small fragments in private collections, scions, those at uh, Museum of the Bible, at Azusa Pacific University, and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Fields' pitch was to have all of these included within the new Dead Sea Scrolls editions, effectively, you know, added to the official collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So a couple more things about Weston Fields. First of all, I think it's important to note that he has been involved in the brokering of sales and or the couriering, the delivery and transit of these small little Dead Sea Scrolls fragments between William Cando and the private institutions who bought them, like uh, Azusa Pacific University, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and uh, another private collector, a wealthy attorney, and owns a uh, theological library, a very large theological library in which he houses uh, large collections of books, but also a handful of artifacts, including uh, one of these fragments, uh, these supposed fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Also, Weston Fields is involved with, uh, with another company called Facsimile Editions. This is a company that makes high, high quality, museum quality replicas of uh, manuscripts to sell to institutions and actual museums. And um, they also make these fantastic, perfect, precise replicas of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, in particular those that were discovered in uh, Cave One. And these things sell for tens of thousands of dollars. So, no, I, I mean, it's important to point out that the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation has no institutional affiliation of any kind. It's more like a club for enthusiasts and they raise money and they donate money to academic projects all associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's nice, but they don't have any affiliation with any any actual academic or scientific organization, least of all the Israel Antiquities Authority who owns and controls the Dead Sea Scrolls. So again, being added to the board of the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation is not some tremendous achievement. Most of what the board thinks and does is not taken seriously by scholars. It's certainly not taken seriously by the Israel Antiquities Authority. So this idea that no one bothered to check the original authentic scrolls is absolute nonsense. I mean, I already mentioned how scholars have for decades been looking at the authentic Dead Sea Scrolls under microscopes. As we were working on the fragments in Scoyan's collection, and then while I was working on the stuff at the Museum of the Bible, we were paying very close, careful attention to how these things precisely compared to as much of the material as we could, you know, investigate already at the IAA. Tour Life would make trips at least once a year to the IAA in order to investigate uh, Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, and he would do so under a microscope. I have been at the IAA three times to investigate original manuscripts under a microscope. Michael Langlois, I know, has been in the IAA several times to do exactly the same thing. And we have captured hundreds of photographs ourselves using much of the same equipment that we used on the uh, fragments in the Scoyan collection as well as in the Museum of the Bible uh, in an effort to demonstrate and to confirm the kinds of stark differences that we had been seeing from the start between those fragments in these private collections and the authentic ones. So when Evans talks about how Weston Fields has told him 
that all the same features that we observed in uh, the fragments in private collections are also on all of the original Dead Sea Scrolls. This is certainly not the case. The same features are not on all of them, but there are similar features on a very small handful of fragments that exist in the collection of authentic manuscripts. And it's important to note that the severity and the magnitude of the types of damage and the anomalies that we have observed in the so-called post-2002 Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, those sold to private collections, which we uh, believe to be modern forgeries, they are dramatically different from the similar types of things that we see in the original Dead Sea Scrolls. There is an unmistakable qualitative difference here, but importantly, I suspect... This is not something that Evans is aware of. And the reason he's not aware of this is because he's not a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. I very seriously doubt he's ever even been inside the IAA. I don't think he's been inside the Shrine of the Book. And he's never actually inspected himself authentic Dead Sea Scrolls fragments as I and every other Dead Sea Scroll scholar has done and needs to do for their work. We need to talk about this, uh, this box and the Swiss vault. We have been hearing about this box of fragments owned by William Cando, supposedly sitting in a Swiss vault for two decades now. Importantly, as far as I'm aware, no one has actually seen this box. There's no inventory of the fragments inside the box, but scholars are somehow supposed to just accept William Candle at his word that this box exists and that it's been full of fragments since 1966 or 1967. So we need to get into a little bit of the history here. In 1967, Frank Moore Cross, who was one of the original editors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, he went to Beirut to meet with William Candle's father. Khalil Iskandar Shahin, who was nicknamed Kando. And Kando was the uh, antiquities dealer who handled almost all of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls fragments. He was buying them from the uh, Bedouin who were finding them in the caves in the desert and then brokering them for sale to the Palestinian Archaeological Museum. So Cross goes in 1967 to meet Kando in Beirut and he goes because he wants to buy the largest of all the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Temple Scroll. But he's disappointed because when he gets there, Kando meets him and he doesn't have the Temple Scroll with him. All he has is this box with a handful of small fragments in them. Cross, you know, kind of sifts through what's what's in there, is not really interested in buying this stuff. He wants the Temple Scroll and then he leaves. As the story goes, this box filled with fragments was then taken by Kando, Kando Sr., and uh, sent off to Switzerland and put inside storage in a vault from which he would periodically draw a fragment or two over the next several decades and sell these to private collectors. So there are a smattering of sales of individual small fragments from Kando to private collectors we hear of in 1964, 1967, 1977. But importantly, when Kando Sr. is still alive in 1992, just before his death in 93, he's approached by Martin Skoyan, the Norwegian collector, about the possibility of buying Dead Sea Scrolls. And he says to him, those days are gone. And that's the last he said on the matter before he died the following year. The story of the box that Cross saw in 1967 provides some cover for the existence for, I believe it's over a hundred tiny fragments which have been sold to private institutions and sold for huge sums of money. Importantly, it's against the law to sell artifacts that have come out of Israel if it had not already left the country prior to 1970. 
the box provides some some cover for the story of the existence of these fragments but even more importantly than that it provides protection to the private collectors that their fragments if they are indeed genuine won't be clawed back and nationalized by the israeli government you know as having left the country after uh, 1970 if that indeed has taken place in November 2008, a list of 14 fragments uh, began circulating. These were 14 fragments that, that supposedly were in Kando's vault. These were mostly purchased by uh, Southwestern Baptist in 2010, although a handful were purchased by Skoyan and a, a couple also by the Museum of the Bible. But also important to note is that Skoyan had managed to be already purchasing prior to the uh, availability of this list as well as after fragments that never even appeared on it. This is an apocryphal story that has been circulating for decades now, but without any or just a very small amount of corroborating evidence. Why not just show us the vault, Mr. Kando? Why not just even an inventory of what's inside the vault and something that we can date back to its arrival in Switzerland, supposedly in 1967, with how valuable and important this material supposedly is, one would think that there's some record of its transit into Switzerland. Why not this? And for the love of God, Weston, please get these volumes of your history out. I, I mean, it's been 14 years since you published volume one, which was excellent. But we've been hearing about volumes two and three being impressed now for, I feel like it's been over a decade. What is the hold up? Here, is, Sean, this is the interesting thing. Hmm. We've always wondered why expensive leather scrolls instead of cheaper papyrus. And of course, we're talking about a library that at one time would have had way more than a thousand books. We have a about 900 and fragments of 990 or whatever now one cave completely washed out so all of its contents ended up mm. in dead sea molecules today if you can find them so we're talking about a library that probably had 1200 1300 1400 writings at one time and uh the vast majority of them with very few exceptions were written on leather why and one of the theories is purity concerns jewish cows jewish leather handled properly can be used for these sacred writings copies of scripture and so on papyrus imported from egypt no telling whose hands handled the papyrus we don't want so even though the leather is harder to make harder to prepare more expensive that and so that's one of the theories but most of them and i've seen the reports there was a conference in princeton in 1997 and we had all the, the DNA reports given to us at that time. These, these studies of the leather was so, so uh, specialized and so sensitive. Human skin oil from the scribes handling the scrolls. We picked up the human DNA off the That's leather scroll. Yeah. Hmm. First of all, um, Evans is wrong here about the DNA. Yes, DNA tests have been conducted on the scrolls in the 90s, and I believe more recently by the Hands That Wrote the Bible Project under Miladin Popovich at the University of Groningen. They haven't released any of, of these findings, but as far as I am aware, importantly, and I have been in touch with a member of the team from the Hands That Wrote the Bible Project, and he was able to confirm this for me. As far as I am aware, while they have found traces of human DNA on the scrolls. All of this has basically been discarded as having occurred through contamination. I'm, I mean, it's, it's easy to see why. Was this DNA that was left stray by the Bedouin who found the original scroll fragments? Is, does this come from the scholars who were handling the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments? It could come from anywhere. I mean, how do you even isolate a source to say nothing for tracing that back 2,000 years to an individual scribe. It's, it's pretty nonsensical. But 
it's interesting because it also reminds me of something that none other than Weston Fields said in a public lecture that took place at Lanier Theological Library back in uh, 2010 or 2011. It really hit me one time years and years ago when I was going through the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem where they have a, a facsimile of the Isaiah Scroll. And as I was taking some friends uh, walking around it, I thought of the incident in the New Testament when Jesus stands up in the synagogue and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. And as I was standing there looking at that uh, uh, facsimile, I thought, well, now uh, suppose we had a way of testing for DNA from fingerprints on the real thing that is, that is in, the, in the vault just across from the entrance there uh, to the shrine of the book. Now, I'm not saying that that scroll in the vault is the actual one that Jesus held in the synagogue. But think of this from the standpoint of chronology and geography. It's possible that it was the one. It's possible that if we had a way of detecting the fingerprints and the DNA on that scroll, that it could be connected with Jesus. Now, I'm not saying it is, but that will help you understand why there has been so much excitement about the Dead Sea Scrolls. It connects us back so far. Well, here's now the new theory. This, this is brand new. The stuff I've told you up to okay. now, a few people know. Now, everybody's going to hear this. We think that's why they used the leather. It was a purity issue. All of these scrolls, when the leather was made, the leather was stored for a period of time. Quarantine, not used too soon. And of course, this is super dry, don't forget. This is the Dead Sea. That would dry out that leather so fast. And so if this leather was quarantined, some kind of ritual, some kind of purity thing before you could write sacred text on it, all of the leather would have an aged, cracked appearance. And because it's been handled and put in places and moved around, some of it would have a dust or whatever embedded in it. And so all of these clues that my former student and others picked up on legitimate, good observation using the microscope, that explains them. And so what we could be uh, looking at without ever thinking about it before, that's why we need to look at all the scrolls under a microscope and ask ourselves, hey, is this some kind of purity thing? <sighs> the quarantine theory. So I have to say at the outset that I find Evans's idea here preposterous. I mean, not the bit about, about purity concerns, it's uh, legitimate to think that um, purity had some role to play in the rationale for using parchment as opposed to papyrus, although that's far from universal. There's lots of papyrus manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, that's legitimate. The stuff I have a problem with is this idea that manuscripts were, or or skins were manufactured, the parchments were manufactured and then somehow stored for, what, years? Until they're completely dried out and that's why these fragments look so bad? No, it's pretty nonsensical and here's why. The so-called post-2002 fragments, these are the ones that were sold to private collectors. These post-2002 fragments don't look anything like the original authentic Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, for most of them, the leather is quite thick. It has a chemical, physical composition that doesn't even really look like parchment. It might even be just ancient scraps of leather from old shoes or even wineskins that somebody used uh, to write text on and try to pass off as actual parchments. No. They are fundamentally different than what we see of the authentic original Dead Sea Scrolls. One of our observations was that this terrible aged condition, as noted, of these uh, small fragments was a huge contributing factor to why the writing on them looked so poor. You know, the, the ink would not just jump over cracks in the leather. As I mentioned, it would fill them like a swimming pool. And this is dramatically different 
from what we see in the authentic Dead Sea Scrolls, which in several cases have also been delaminated, have cracked and suffered this same sort of deterioration, but we don't see anything close uh, to what's taking place in the, uh, the post-2002 fragments. We also have uh, manuscripts in the authentic Dead Sea Scrolls where the condition of the skin has had an effect, an impact on the quality of the writing. But again, it just looks so dramatically different from anything that we see in the post-2002 Dead Sea Scrolls. Here's an example of uh, 4Q510. This is a manuscript that I was commissioned to analyze and write the paleography for. And one of the features of it is that in the scraping process of this parchment, it became abraded. And as a result, the scribe, who is obviously very skilled, is still uh, struggling a little bit with the quality of his surface. But again, it looks nothing like the kinds of errors and uh, difficulty that we see taking place in the post-2002 fragments. So I think the question needs to be posed with regards to this new quarantine theory by Evans. But first, it's important to point out that this theory accounts for, you know, this one feature of the dried parchments, but completely misses the numerous other factors that we observed in drawing our conclusions about why we think these fragments are forgeries. So I think right out of the gate, this theory fails. But more importantly, the question we should be asking is why, even if we were to accept that this is a possibility, why is it restricted to such a small, such a small selection of just a tiny few manuscripts compared to this larger collection. And more troublingly, the one feature that all of these manuscripts do have in common is that they were sold to private collections. We could be stumbling into a whole new area of inquiry that nobody had ever thought about thanks mm. to this controversy over whether or not these fragments are fake. They aren't fake, they're genuine. So there you go. Okay. Isn't it an in world we live in <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing i want to make sure i understand because you've used words could and possibly and may and at the end you made a pretty bold statement and said these are not a fake is this a working theory that other scholars are going to check or are you saying this is a done deal we know they're not fake i would say it's a done deal um, we know they're not fake i'm saying you know could and should with respect to why the leather was old before using it for okay. writing but i'd say in most cases all of the fragments they have are genuine and that'd be wow. south their, their fragments are very likely genuine they came out of candles box uh, a box that is wow. contained since the 1960s okay. and uh, bible their fragments are very likely genuine all of them same with the Zeus of Pacific. Yeah. Same with uh, the Norwegian collector we've been talking about. Yeah. Okay. So presumably they know this. I haven't seen any press on this. What are they waiting for? Why is this not coming out to kind of redeem themselves, so to speak? Because the assumption, as far as I've seen it, is that these are all fake and they were duped. Yeah, I know. And that's where it's been left in, uh, in the media. I suspect no one is going to jump up as I am right now, because I don't have mm. any skin in the game, uh, you know, it's whatever, however it turns out. My guess is that there's such a serious legal matter here now that oh. people, several million dollars, at least four different parties, several million dollars in aggregate, buying things that they then had reason to believe were fake are now talking about and perhaps engaged in lawsuits. Now the word is coming out. They probably aren't fake at all. So my guess, and I'm the son of an attorney and the brother of an attorney, <laughs> my guess is they're saying, look, this, these things, we have to get experts to look at them very carefully. Mm. So if Weston Fields says what he says, and they start looking at the war scroll and, you know, the hymn scroll 
and scrolls that were found right away in the very first century before anybody would have even dreamed of trying to come up with fakes. And they know these are authentic. There's no question about it. These were actually found in situ by archaeologists and so on to look at them. And lo and behold, the same phenomena are there. The cracked leather, the ink jumping the cracks, the ink going over dirt marks and abrasions and that kind of thing. Then I think what will happen is from a scientific point of view, the conclusion will be reached. These fragments aren't fakes. They're just as authentic as these other things, too. So that, I think, is where it that'd be my guess. Well, from a scientific point of view, it shouldn't take more than a couple of months. It, you know, you get permission to look at under a microscope. You don't have to look at the entire document, but just look at one sheet from the war scroll, one sheet from the Hodoyot, the hymn scroll, one sheet from this, that, and the other. Look at about you know, and a sample of 10 or 12 from cave one and a few others from cave four. Just look at them, look at the leather under the microscope. This really isn't rocket science. It's just using a microscope and, and using some light imagery to get some certain color patterns and so on. So it's not that hard. And then look at these fragments and compare them. And if it looks, if the phenomena, the stuff we're seeing, these cracks, the ink jumping cracks, etc. If what we're seeing looks the same, and no one doubts the age of the leather, so no one's claiming okay. the leather it's, was made 20, 30 years ago. They're all agreeing it's very old leather, and they, they can't tell the leather from of the new fragments, the recently published fragments, from, from the leather of the original fragments. So that's not the issue. And, and if the so-called evidence that says this ink was applied 20 years ago instead of 2,000 years ago, if the evidence indicates that it is, in fact, applied a long time ago, I think then that settles it. I think then, you know, how can anybody say they're fakes? How can anybody say they're modern? And I think that ends it. And then legally, you got to settle it, got to figure out, you know, apologize for suing somebody for the wrong reason, I guess. But wow. see, that's the science. Mm. But when you get into the legal thing and the political thing, it's like this pandemic. Well, then, who, you know, the science might not be followed. Then it becomes a legal tug of war. Mm. It goes legal at its courts. And now we're talking a couple of years. So it could be a couple months. It could be a couple of years. I don't know. Mm. In his email to me, uh, Dr. Evans told me that uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary has already initiated a lawsuit. And another suit was filed by Azusa Pacific University against the antiquities dealer who sold them their fragments back in late 2019. The APU lawsuit is currently tied up in, uh, in motions and has not yet gone to trial. But I think this is probably what's at the heart of Evans' very weird appearance on Sean's channel. Honestly, I don't really believe, certainly... I don't think there's many scholars who care one way or the other about the authenticity or the forgery of these little fragments that now exist in private collections, Scoyans and APU and Museum of the Bible, etc. Because they're small. They're tiny compared to this huge collection of amazingly rich material that we know is authentic already in Israel, and the fragments are n mostly just not all that interesting, even from like a text critical perspective or an historical sociological perspective. They don't tell us anything new. They don't provide much insight. You know, I once wrote in a popular article that the post-2002 Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, those bought mostly by evangelical Christian institutions, uh, universities, colleges, seminaries. I wrote that these were like modern day relics, providing uh, people a chance or an opportunity to touch the Bible or see the Bible that Jesus touched and read. And I think Craig may also have an investment here, not a financial one, but more of a reputational one. Part of me wonders, I don't know, but I wonder if uh, he's been asked to participate or to provide some sort of expert testimony on behalf 
of the defendants in one of these lawsuits? Is this him just coming to bat for his newfound friend, Weston Fields at the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation? All of this just feels very, very convenient to me. So that's that. And I really don't expect anything more uh, to come of this. No working scholars in the Dead Sea Scrolls or Second Temple Jewish manuscripts and texts will take any of this seriously. And the reason for that is because the science really is that strong. Moreover, I have no confidence at all that the IAA is going to run the very expensive kinds of tests that uh, Evans and Weston Field have proposed that they conduct on their Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, why would they? We already know all of those manuscripts are authentic and the types of tests that Evans and Fields envision benefits absolutely no one except private collectors. And I assure you, the IAA has no interest whatsoever in helping that lot. No, I, I think this all ends here. So... I did want to say one more thing, and I, I want to deliver this message directly to you, Dr. Evans. Please stop calling me your student or your former student. I earned a uh, PhD from the University of Manchester. I've had multiple postdoctoral appointments in Europe and in Canada. I have published my dissertation with the very prestigious E.J. Brill. I have taught courses in Europe and Canada. I've served on numerous academic communities. I've examined dissertations and supervised theses. I've reviewed academic journal articles. I've been asked to review an academic grant application for the Canadian government. I have been published extensively within the field of Dead Sea Scrolls and early Judaism and with a specific focus on my skills as a paleographer and a scribal specialist. You know, I don't doubt that I'm a bit of a catch and one whom many in our field would like to claim as part of his pedagogy. But like it or not, Dr. Evans, I am your colleague, and I think I've earned the right to be recognized and addressed appropriately for my own contributions to biblical scholarship. So that's all. I hope you appreciate the clarification I provided here in this uh, response. Please stay on the lookout for an upcoming installment for my series, The Dead Sea Scrolls Unapologetically. The third video will be coming out soon. Until then, I'm Kip Davis. Thanks for watching. <laughs>